Sorry, guys. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting. I'm your host, DJ Impact, and I got all of the bad boys here with me today. See. Yeah, it's good to see uh, all of you here. You know, not uh, taking a break of some sort. That's right. I so, don't know. All about them Lakers, baby. Lakers and Cowboys. <laughs> today. Boom. Where are we going to start Next with thing our... you're going to tell me is that you're a fucking Yankees fan. Oh, boy. Oh, no. <laughs> Now, we got somebody that is, but <laughs> we do urge everyone to come to think about it to uh, jump onto the uh, our live video feed for comments. As I'm sure our three counts today is going to really have you uh, typing away. And as we can, we will read off those comments and uh, and we'll just go from there. So we'll start with our first count, which comes from uh, a couple of sites. The first one here is cagesideseats.com and it's titled Eric Bischoff thinks fans are ditching pro wrestling for cable news. Now it reads that viewership of pro wrestling has seen a steady decline for a number of years and there are many factors involved in that decline. General interest in what the likes of WWE has to offer is a big one, but even AEW isn't seeing numbers like they once were uh, when the promotion debuted. Also, it says that on his latest 83 Weeks uh, podcast episode, this is what he had put out there. He says, the one question that nobody ever asks about fucking anything, whether it's politics, entertainment, or whatever it is, is why. Why did those people leave and where did they go? I have a theory and my guess or instinct tells me that 18 to 49 demo, my sense is that those people are watching the news. He also quotes, look at Tucker Carlson's 18 to 49. Look at CNN's 18 to 49. Look at MSNBC. That was the wrestling audience. Where have they gone? They've gone to cable news. Why have they gone to cable news? Because cable news is more like professional wrestling than professional wrestling used to be. Their promos are fucking awesome. He also quotes, regardless of your political ideologies or what you believe in or where you get your information from, it doesn't fucking matter. Everybody does the same thing. They get up there uh, and they're, they're, they're fucking argue and they cut great promos on each other. It's great narrative. There's almost always someone up there that you want to choke and there's almost always someone up there that's saying what you believe in. So you're investing more emotion watching cable news than you get from watching wrestling because the promos are better. Now, we also linked that from another article we got from the chicagoreader.com and it's titled, Politics is Wrestling. The fights are fake, but the folks pulling the strings behind the scenes are real. And I'll just read one quote for him. He says, I felt similar distressed when I learned that our national politics is, a, is as fake as pro wrestling. On television, our leaders appear to do battle. They tear up speeches, name call, and thumb their chest. But behind closed doors, our two dominant political parties are working for the same group of wealthy donors. Well, guys, it looked like we lost our king. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, some Your point, king. I'm, yeah. <laughs> so uh, at some point, I guess he'll be back. Who knows? But let's get into this, fellas. Um, does Eric Bischoff have a point? Does the writer of his article have a point? Is is it, Let's start off with, let's say, do we believe that's where the fans, I mean, there's been a huge drop off since uh, the start of COVID and it seems like trying to grab them all back hasn't happened. And maybe that's just because fully wrestling fully hasn't gotten back to having their, uh, their audience members back. And, you know, maybe... You know, wrestling is one of those things that I, I hate to say it. When people stop watching it from some point, sometimes it's hard for them to get back. You know, so they find interest in other things. You know, that's how UFC grown over time. Is it true? Maybe politics is where they're going and now getting their sort of their their battles in this. What say you all? Anyway. I mean, I. I think that uh, they make a, an interesting point, but um, 
I think I, th I think people have always watched watched the news, just just in general because it is uh, it is very entertaining. And no matter what side you're on, it, it's easy for you to engage. But um, it's probably, if anything, ramped up because I mean, a it's COVID. We're still a little bit on shutdown, and B we're getting closer to the damn election. So at the end of the day, you know, shit is getting hot. People are tuning in. You know, everybody has an opinion or a side they want to jump in on. So, I mean, I could definitely see for that, dem that demo uh, graphic that he had talked about. Yeah, the majority of people in that age category are probably tuning into that on a regular basis. But do I feel like it's that's what's drawing away from wrestling? I think no, I don't think so. Okay. I, I, I actually one thing that I'll mention is something that a lot of people forget whenever they try to correlate the numbers between you know how things were during the attitude era versus how they are now and that is the actual passage of time between those two periods so you got to figure the attitude era was 20 plus years ago mm -hmm. okay 20 plus years add that on to the age of the people that were watching in the attitude era and they could actually be outside of that 18 to 49 demographic which is one of the more popular arguments as to why NXT does so well with that 50 plus demographic when we talk about the demos on Wednesdays, because mm. you have those people that have indexed out of the 18 <coughs> to 49 uh, and into the 50 plus. So um, I think that it's, it, it's apples and oranges. You have two totally different crowds at this point. Interesting. Matt Michaels, what's your take, man? I don't know. The guy in the White House is a fucking WWE guy. So, I mean, <laughs> technically, can we count the ratings from politics right now onto the wrestling? <laughs> solve the problem that way? I mean, he is a Hall of Famer. Exactly. It's true. It's true. There you go. <laughs> and and he, the guy's, the other guy's wife was in his cabinet. You know? So, why not? Just Just give it to him. Just give them the ratings. <laughs> this way, everyone's happy, right? Combine all the numbers. Fuck it. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> but really, really, does it really fucking matter at the end of the day? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I would assume in the wrestling industry, there are the guys are trying to truly figure out why they have lost a lot of their fans outside of just it being COVID. I mean, to lose a big drop, and that's from all companies, to where did they all just go? You know, and so someone's thinking whether they have to go somewhere because you just don't be, you're not engaged into something. So what are they being engaged in? UFC numbers haven't picked up dramatically elsewhere. So I guess Bischoff is thinking, well, maybe... Politics is where it is, you know? I don't know. Let me ask you guys this question here. Uh, do you believe, though, uh, and this is going now not only to, to Bischoff's argument, but also the writer, when he says that politics in many ways is, is just like wrestling? Do you guys, would you yeah. guys would agree with that? Without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing is, it, it, it's, it's a fucking soap opera. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it is. You know, politics has become the uh, the the best fictional, non-fictional show on TV, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's a caricature of what it once was. Well, let me ask so. you this: is is it that kind of the problem though? Because politics itself, despite what we all may think of it, and look, half of the country we know don't even vote, and for whatever reason why they don't are not engaged. The bottom line is there are decisions that are being made to affect our lives. So why is why would politics be treated or thought of differently than it just being like a show, like a movie, like a wrestling match? Why is it taking it to a point where it should be looked at as serious? Uh, I mean, I, I'll go ahead and take that. I, it... I think to a certain ex extent, I think it's a lot of it has to come with no uh, knowledge base. Um, and the reason why I say that is because 
I had an opportunity about two years ago to talk to a couple high school kids that were seniors and juniors and probably mm-hmm. a couple sophomores. And I, I told them it was interesting on, I remember one of the coolest classes I ever had was, um, uh, you know, they, they, well, I don't know if they still do in, in, as a senior in high school, but you, in order to graduate high school, you had to take government, you know, and it basically just told you the ins and out of how our government is ran, what are the three branches of government and whatnot. And so when I talked to them, they had a couple of kids that were kind of explaining, yeah, I took that class too, but you know, I just slept through the class or whatever. It was, it was, it, they all were kind of saying the same vein, like it wasn't important. And so I kind of wonder, does that kind of the reason why sometimes, but again, you know, like we said earlier in the article, the age group we're talking about is not that age group. But when I think about my generation, you know, particularly, I think that the drama does kind of play a bigger role now than what mm-hmm. at least I remember as a teenager. I used to think it was kind of boring, you know what I mean? And you know, I tried to pick the best candidate at 18 when I could vote as best I could, but I really wasn't as interested. But now I look at it now, I'm interested. And some of it that makes it interesting to watch is some of the drama. Some of the people that come up there, the guests, especially the guests. There's so many guests that they have that are analysts and, and are professors and are advocates and they come up and I'm just like, wow. Who knew there were so many experts at politics? And when you hear them, some of them sound ridiculous. And, you know, some of them are on point. So many experts on politics. Have you opened Facebook lately? Well, we haven't even begun with Facebook. <laughs> I'm <yet>. just saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it, it astounds me just the, the sheer number of people that have, you know, decided that they're going to become politically vocal, yet they haven't done research. And that's one thing that's astounding to me. But um, I think that it, it does bode well um, for us as a country um, mm-hmm. that more people are taking a vested interest into how the government works and moreover, how the government works for each and every one of us. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's, that's very come key. On. They're watching either Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. They ain't learning shit, man. Mm-hmm. That's just fucking pure entertainment. They, they don't teach you anything. And then if they do teach you something, then the people watching Fox are going to say they're teaching them the wrong thing over there on MSNBC and CNN and vice versa. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's bullshit. It's just people just have – they're out of their fucking mind – and they're being lied to. They're being fed bullshit. And these people who sell it are great at doing it. That's it. So where are people then supposed to go for their news if all the networks are bullshit? Well, you apparently know- Simon goes to either a high school or a nightclub. <laughs> oh, or my a- gosh. <laughs> oh, apparently. my gosh. Wow. You took totally what I said, put it out of context. But I'll let you finish. Go ahead. <laughs> no so wow. so I'll, I'll i'll go ahead and answer the question and yeah. um so it's it's been mentioned here that my you know my stances are typically to the right mm-hmm. but what i'll do is whenever there's anything any kind of news story that comes out what i will do is i will consult media from both sides of you know both sides of the political spectrum mm-hmm. what has to be done is you have to internally you have to be able to to discern the points from the left-leaning article and the points from the right-leaning article and just know that it's going to be somewhere in between and then you have to do your own research to find other knowledge or what sin city steve is saying no what sin city oh my gosh what sin city steve is trying to say is is use discernment in research yeah just do your own research I don't give a flying fuck. I don't want to do any research. I, I don't give a flying fuck if your opinions are exactly opposite of mine yeah. after you do your own research. Mm-hmm. Exactly but to not I'm do saying. any research and just say, oh, oh hey, you know, up? this what guy's up? bad or that, that woman sucks. Without doing your own research, you're shooting yourself in the foot and you're going to come off looking like a complete fucking idiot. And what I am saying right there is the fact that you're going to have every single person in that coveted age category of 18 to 49 who are way below that, you know, 30 year old line where they ain't, they're just out of their fucking minds, man. They're not listening to anything. 
you know mm. i mean you're you're saying it in, in a pure adult manner you should be able to analyze both sides absolutely without a mm. doubt but, but i don't but, think people right. want to though that's the thing they don't that's want to. exactly they, they want to be fed what entertains them and that's where i would say the article does make sense is much like wrestling and how we talk about smarks and how they think they know the business and they know everything much as the same with facebook particularly and politics yeah. Most of these people are only reading one side. They're not reading yeah. the whole gambit. And it's okay to have an opinion, but have an opinion of what you have, but do the research. Yeah, but they're the definitely question, locked in their own echo chambers. And yeah, and the question really here is, Simon, is uh, who are the high school girls' favorite wrestler? Is it Roman Reigns still, or? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't ask him that question. <laughs> I was only, I was only just merely saying that. It's interesting how when I went to high school and I took government, I thought it was a privilege to learn about government outside of my parents. Because a lot of people do make their political choices based on what their family does. And I felt it was an opportunity for me to engage myself to say, okay, what do I like? That whether the family likes it or not. And I thought it was cool because at the end of the day, we didn't have the internet like we did back when I was a senior, which was 1999. We didn't have it really truly like that. So it was like, hey, I feel like there's an opportunity for me to be empowered. And that's why I was saying it in reference to that, is when I talked to some of these younger cats, they, they was like, whatever, it was just a regular class. Home ec was probably more important. That's right. When he was in high school back in the 70s. I said 1999. Let's move on. Go. All Let's right, move all on. right, all right. Oh my gosh, I'm not even going to give you that. Let's move on. <laughs> Well, so that's what you're doing in the high schools. All right. <laughs> Let me get you in the conversation, King Lucky. Uh, welcome back. Just kind of curious. I know you kind of read up, so you kind of know how to answer anyway. Do you believe that uh, fans are ditching wrestling for politics? I'll start off with that one. And the second one is, do you believe uh, politics in many ways is like wrestling? So two-part question. Yeah, uh, I will say, you know, it's a component of it, right? <laughs> it's entertainment. Um <laughs> One of the things that I I think happens too, is, I don't think solely the reason why, I don't think they're ditching it solely for politics, but I mean, I think also the way that you're viewing content now has totally changed. So you may have an opportunity to watch something that draws your interest, um, you know, that maybe draws your interest more than wrestling at the time. And then you can go back at a later time and watch wrestling. You can watch it on a streaming service or a website. You don't necessarily have to watch wrestling when it comes out. So if Monday Night Raw has traditionally been boring to you, you'll watch something else first. And I think that that also plays a factor in it, you know. And and uh, secondly, it is. It, it's totally a circus, you know, uh, depending on what party you're for and all that. Um, you know, it's entertainment. You know, the the smear campaigns or the smear commercials, you know, you start to see them running now because it's that time. So, yeah, I mean, it's entertaining. Um, you know, some things are said that are just way out there and you're like, OK, but it's entertaining and different people. It rubs different people different ways. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility for you to see them draw eyes away. All right. Well, fellas, I hopefully um, if that's where folks are getting their entertainment from, then I, I guess, you know, enjoy. But I will still say that it should be something that should be taken serious uh, so that you make the right decision that will, you see, affect you and affect others. So one thing to think about there. Let's go over to our second count. And this one. Uh, actually, it was uh, my good old boy, uh, Simon Street Sand. It didn't come from- Young an, boy. Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh. My, my oh boy. Um, <laughs> no, go ahead and finish the statement. My <laughs> young boy. I can't, I can't do it. Don't say that, don't uh, say that. <laughs> but anyway, the, it came off of Facebook and uh, it seemed like it, there was a um, just someone decided to want to post and it said, um, MVP may have single-handedly rejuvenated the careers of the Black roster in WWE, not just the members of the Hurt Business, but also given the rub to Apollo and Ricochet. He needs to be spoken about as, up, as the upper echelon of Black wrestlers. 
So MVP, since he's been back there, I mean, it definitely have shown that the, the all of the African-American wrestlers that's on the, uh, especially from the Raw brand, has been getting a, a push. And I mean, it's really coming off legit. I'm really enjoying the storyline that's been there to it. Should MVP be given the credit as to what we've been seeing since his return? Well, I mean, I think it's been a perfect storm, right? Um, he's leading the charge this year uh, with the, the talent on Raw, but I really believe they got a wake-up call, WWE did, when they just accidentally stumbled on Kofi Mania. And then you start to see some things change, and you started to see, um, you know, how big – that that community plays in wrestling. And so now you see a willingness more than ever to give those opportunities where maybe they weren't before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it was just before it was the new day because they're entertaining. But now you're starting to see Street Profits, The Herd Business, Ricochet, um, Sasha, and you can just go on and on and on. Um, but I think you're starting to see more opportunities. And, you know, it's good that, he came up with a quality faction. They put some good members in there. They look great, you know, um, mm -hmm. and so they've been booked good to this point. So we'll see what happens. I think he does deserve some of the credit. Yes. Okay. What about you, Simon? You was uh, hyped about it. Now, what's your take? No, I was definitely hyped about it because, you know, when I saw the post, um, it definitely struck me because it's what I've been kind of thinking about, especially over the last month. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at it, uh, MVP came back to uh, WWE January 26-ish, somewhere around there. And since then, he actually just immediately just went to work, obviously making his presence known. I felt a little bit better than some people that come back in that capacity that's been away for a longer time. Mm -hmm. It's like he knew where his footing was. He had a goal objective. And um, if you look at some articles that, you know, I, I had, a, you know, as I was presented it to Impact, I was kind of looking at it to kind of support that. I began kind of looking at MVP of why he left WWE. And he went to New Japan and he, he said he loved the style of wrestling that was there. And it's interesting because most of the style of wrestling that's in Japan is strong style. And it's interesting enough because when I think about what were ways to kind of display the black wrestler as far as a formula yes i think wwe as you mentioned earlier lucky hit on that 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 pop with kofi mania and with kind of the street profits but i feel like the wwe didn't have somebody that had a formula of a way to in a way normalize it to where it can be consistently implemented and i think that's what why i feel that mvp should be deserving to be talked about because you know I was joking with somebody and I said look if, if MVP if this goes right in the next couple of uh, you know months going into WrestleMania you really see the Hurt Business as a standing um, uh, uh, faction that's not based like the Nation of Domination which the WWE has done in the past mm -hmm. it's a normal faction and it just happens to be four black guys in it and the storyline is engaging you mm -hmm. also have Apollo Crews, who has really gotten a vision. It's incident enough you say Apollo Crews, because in an article that I also was reading called Talk Sports, mm -hmm. and the author is an Alex McCarthy, he talks about MVP, and this is back in July. And mm -hmm. he was talking about how MVP in this article was talking about how much he said he liked Crews. He said he has a huge upside because he's coachable. Now, when I heard that, I thought about what we've talked about for years, how like, like, like we just feel like something was missing for uh, Apollo Crews, something that I felt like the WWE just couldn't provide because they didn't have it. That's MVP. I feel like Bobby Lashley, which I've said before, back in TNA days, there was a faction with Bobby Lashley, MVP, and Kenny King. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. One of the best factions that I liked watching in TNT, uh, TNA. So I, I liked it because it was something that worked. It's something that made sense. It's almost similar to the Hurt Business. It's about that money. It's about that opportunity, CNZ in the day. And if you need us, we could put in the work. Getting back to my closing statement is I will say that if MVP, I'm calling it right now, if this goes good going through WrestleMania and mm -hmm. this is the, the quintessential uh, uh, formula on how to promote 
black wrestlers to being normal and not have to have a crazy gimmick that's tied to race per se, then I'm going to call MVP Moses. Mm. Wow. Well, MVP <laughs> is Moses. You can look at, you can look at your wrist because it's still the same color, brother. But my time is over and you can have it, Matt Michaels. Well, let me ask you, uh, Sin City or Matt Michaels, you guys want to have any take on this? Does MVP deserve some credit for uh, what he has done for some of the black talent we've seen on the raw side? Would you just would you give him any credit on that, or you just happen to think he just was there at the right time and it just kind of just worked out that way? I'd say without a doubt, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah, he I, it it speaks for itself. Um, since he started back with the company in a consultative type of a role mm-hmm. and as an agent, yeah, it you'd be stupid to not believe that there's a correlation between the two. Mm-hmm. Honestly, um, it it's. He's got he's got his fingerprints all over all over Raw. Um, that's one of the one of the bright spots of Raw is the hurt business yeah. and the people that he's helped to elevate without question. All right, all right. You're shaking your head there, Michaels. What's your take? <laughs> no. Nope. Nope. This is the one thing that you have to take into consideration. Mm-hmm. Lashley and Shelton Benjamin were people who have been around for fucking ever. Mm-hmm. How is this breaking any new ground? Well, you just took said- two veteran guys and put them with one other veteran mm-hmm. and then exposed no one new. It's not revolutionizing anything or anyone. Mm. It, 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 if I may send a rebuttal your way, Mr. Michaels. You can I, send your butthole my way any day. I didn't say butthole. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm disgusted. That took a flattered. fucking turn. Yeah, that's her did. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but what I am saying, and, and, and particularly what the gentleman that posted it did say was, you know, what it's doing for Apollo Crews. And it's it's really helping. Even Ricochet this past Monday, this is that was the more natural natural uh, promo I've ever heard Ricochet ever do. You know, he just seemed more in his element, and that's why I say that MVP is the right candidate. And that's why I call him Moses. He does provide a better natural way to present black talent in a capacity that's normal. Sometimes WWE, at times, whether it's their writers or whatever the case may be, they present them and either they overdo it or they over. I don't even know what the word is. They overmake it to where it doesn't really show the talents of the individuals and it makes it too much of like a gimmick around them. So I think that MVP actually does, like Apollo Crews is at an all-time high right now. Cedric Alexander is about to be at an all-time high because he's still him, but in a better type of atmosphere, a better type of him being able to do promos more naturally. And that's where WWE kind of for a long time with the black wrestler had a hard time. They didn't have anybody there that could say, look, bro, this is normal. This is a little bit out, out there. Do you see what I'm saying? You even look at Bobby Lashley. Yeah, Bobby Lashley's been around for a long time. As we forgot the last time Trump was involved in the WWE, Bobby Lashley was there just to kind of tell you. So yes, but for a long time, the only sauce that I said on this show that Bobby Lashley did great one was TNA. It's when he was doing that faction with Kenny King and MVP. That to me is the best Bobby Lash I've ever seen. And so we're seeing that now. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it, I don't know. I, I get what you're saying, Michaels, but I'm telling you right now, when you have somebody in your company that can really point out what's natural and what the audience would seem as natural, you got a winning combination. So I, I will say from uh, the chat, I did have uh, one of uh, people comment, Sam, who's a friend of mine, shout out to Sam. He says, because WWE wasn't doing anything with them, it brings out their potential and it makes the fans care. MVP's return has been amazing. So, I mean, there you go. It resonate. It resonates with some people, you know? Um, and to, to his point, I think that his return has been good. No one said anything about it not being good. I'm arguing the fact that if you really want it to be the um, one pushing those other wrestlers, how come you took those two guys? 
he could have gave the rub to any of those guys right off the bat. So he said maybe, maybe formula. so he said maybe the uh, you know the hurt business could have been Ricochet, Cedric, and you know instead of Shelton. I, and, no, I mean, come yeah. on, mm-hmm. you know that's the other thing. Like, you gotta let you got guy like Titus O'Neil. What are you doing with him? Well, yeah. well so that could but, be said with any of these guys, right? Mm-hmm. That's the other unfair, you know, point in terms of what we can you know, look at as fans as we can just point out and go, well, how about this guy, this guy, and this guy? You know, th- that's the only thing. Well, you make a very good point, Matt Michaels, with that. Why didn't he have the other guys? Because I think the reason why he picked uh, Shelton Benjamin and Bobby Lashley is because he knew he could create the base of the sauce. Like a gumbo, there's a base. It's called a roux. When you make the roux, you can add all the other ingredients in it. And he knew him and Bobby Lashley together was good for business because they've done it before and it's easy to connect like that. And much as our wrestling minds are, we sometimes, when someone comes back, we want instant gratification. We want to know. We don't want the to, to extend it. Okay, it's gone three, four weeks. We've seen him on TV. What the fuck is he doing? MVP didn't do that. He went right on the chase, immediately aligned himself with Bobby Lashley, took out the trash with Lana, no offense to Lana. And then he went ahead and started building a, a legit faction. Now, I know for the worst thing that you've said during this whole fucking thing is my apologies to Lana. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be a little bit nice. I'm just saying it wasn't working for her it with was Bobby Lana. Lashley. Well, um, Lana. Here's, a, here's, here's another thing. Here's another way to look at it. Those guys that he initially brought in are seasoned veterans, right? Mm-hmm. So they have fewer days in front of them than they have, you know, behind them. So uh, you can exactly have so. different iterations of the herd business Ray where Mysterio should be fucking champion. <laughs> where eventually you get to a point where maybe you do bring in Ricochet and you know Apollo Cruz at some point. You know the changing of the guard, the the new the old guard, you know, gets taken out by the new guard. So I mean, if they give it time, you could have this around for a while. Uh, and. Mm. Right. And, 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 and I will say this, too, and I want to reveal what we talk about down the road with regards to Raw, but mm-hmm. what happened on Raw, that, to me, would have been more, is more believable of what happened than what if those other two people would have been part of the Hurt Business, such as Apollo Crews or Ricochet. I felt like the, the way that the order went is the most believable product, and they hit that shit nail on the donkey with, that, with, with regards to that. You know, pin the tail on the donkey, nail on the donkey. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, there we go. We'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all never play pin the tail wait, on the donkey. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Did you play this game with those girls that you were in high school? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Really? First of all, I don't hang out with no Continuity. high school girls but my daughter. But... <laughs> She's not the only one. That's funny. That, I get oh, you that. God. Those were your daughter's friends? Oh, my gosh. I'm, oh. Done. I'm done. Let's move on. Let's this is move getting worse. On. Yeah, it's getting, this, this is getting pretty, pretty All right. Worse. Let's move on to our third count. Have you seen the movie? You Cannot Kill David R. Cat. What? Ah, I tell you. Um, just to start a little bit on that, because I... This was my entertainment for a Friday evening. Wait, we, I, were, supposed, we were supposed to watch it? <laughs> <laughs> what did you do, read it? <laughs> you read the script? <laughs> <laughs> so my whole thing is, and, and I'm not going to say no more than this little bit, and then I'm going to jump in during the conversation when you guys get started. I was not watching. I didn't watch much of WCW at all. I only watched WCW when NWO started off. It was making so much noise that I had to turn the channel from Raw and see what the heck was going on. So I started watching there, and then eventually, as it started to fade out, I, you know, came home. But so I don't remember this whole thing of when David Eric. I do remember there were people that were pissed, but I didn't see the lead up to it. I, I didn't understand any of it. So I'm watching this movie now. And I have some thoughts on it, but I'm going a, I'm to a save it because I'm going to see what you guys think. I think all of you guys lived through or watched WCW as all this was actually happening. Mm-hmm. So the question I'm just going to throw out there is, compared to what you remembered from how you watched it and 
and how upset you were or maybe you were happy does how you remember it fit in perfectly to how what was demonstrated in this particular movie that you watched um uh, how does that fit in or did it not what's your guys take on it it's the new movie that's out and it's out on um uh or online so i don't it's not in the theaters whatever you have to go on to amazon prime or uh or apple or any of those to see your to see the movie but again um you cannot kill david arquette what was you guys take on that particular movie and what you remember during that time can i start so oh. okay first of all shouts out to Lori, who was actually yep. in the film and yep. she she got some good camera time so shout out to you because i know you in the chat you was looking good baby girl you was looking good <laughs> up in there um <clears throat> great great documentary um, because I watched WCW religiously with WWE or WWF at the time, Raw, um, I remember this and I wasn't as pissed as other times in my life where I was pissed about shit like that, but I did think it was stupid as hell that David Arquette won that title. I was just like, this is a little bit stupid, um, but I like the way he did it. I like the way it showed his transition. It showed the reality of our business and that, I think that was his focal point he wanted to do throughout the whole documentary is like a, a story of redemption. And I thought it was excellent. I liked the way it was put together. I liked that it was just very raw. Um, and it, it, I mean, I ain't gonna lie, I kind of teared up at some parts. I ain't gonna lie, just a little bit. And I was like, wow, like, and they brought in good people. DDP was in there. I mean, I mean, you had, uh, and you had Eric Bischoff that really pre presented a good narrative of what happened and why it happened. DDP also said the whole thing too. I loved the way he said, you know, in the whole documentary, like he said, well, what would you do if uh, they said they were going to put the belt on you? Would you say no? I had to be honest with myself. I was like, man, it'd be really hard for me to say no. And it was just a great tale. I, I really appreciate the hell of it. I will be watching it again, actually, uh, with my son. I had to make sure there wasn't no too inappropriate stuff on there. <laughs> Interesting. How, do you, how do you watch that and not be a fan of David Arquette? Um, hmm. I thought... It was, you know, to have the heart and the passion after, you know, having a heart attack and all that stuff, um, you know, to follow through with the comeback. And he got a lot of press, you know, surrounding it. Um, you know, some of the stuff that they talked about with him not becoming a big as, uh, movie star as some of his, you know, contemporaries was, you know, you know, that reminded me that he was on that course of becoming a big star and then got pigeonholed into just doing you know comedies and stuff like that um but wrestling in dangerous environments like when he wrestled outside in the forest with those guys and the ring broke and then wrestling dangerous matches i mean sheer guts to wrestle nick fucking gage mm -hmm. <laughs> not only that but to finish the match with a hole in his neck i was yeah. blown away um, and it, it was just awesome to see him get that Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth moment at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I too got a little emotional at the end of that, where you could kind of, you know, you could feel the waterworks, especially when they had him and Jack Perry, um, because mm -hmm. taking him to the hospital was Luke Perry, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that part really hit me because, you know, he saved his life, and then we all know that. Lou Perry ultimately, you know, uh, died. And so uh, it was, it was great. It was a great piece of uh, a film. I really enjoyed it. I guess if I, after, from the beginning, I probably should have gave a, a spoiler alert because I would have hate for anyone who have not seen it to uh, now feel like they've <laughs> seen everything based on what you're giving, but. Too bad. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, let's, but let's continue though. Go ahead. Um, Sin City, what's yeah. your take, man? So I think that um, I, I can definitely speak to this. Uh, I was watching pro wrestling at the time. And when it happened, uh, I, I completely remember thinking, what the fuck is this shit? And I, I, I was just in disbelief when I, when I saw that David Arquette became the WCW champion. Um, fast forward a little bit, obviously. I uh, got older, matured, and started looking at wrestling from a business mindset. Um, and, you know, this was something that if you watch any shoot interviews 
with anybody involved with WCW, everybody always, you know, gets asked the David Arquette question. And it was, it was something that, you know, I grew to understand and honestly respect the decision uh, because of, you know, all the stuff that, that happened as a result. And, and the film showed a, a great um, kind of a, a montage of all of the, the press stuff that happened as a result of him winning the championship. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that um, really kind of worked and mm -hmm. and endeared Arquette to to me and obviously to all of all of the viewers mm -hmm. is the fact that he started off literally his first booking ended up being with a self described shit promoter uh, where he didn't get paid he got blasted with weapons and and you know got his ass kicked. And he, he literally started from the bottom again. And, you know, I've, he came in right at the, right in the, the penthouse. And then here you go. He makes his comeback and he starts from the outhouse. So it's, it, it was, it was awesome to see. And uh, I, I did have the pleasure of meeting uh, David Arquette um, in New Orleans at WrestleMania 34. <laughs> um, he was taking in, um, some of the shows that weekend, um, some of the indie shows and, uh, super cool guy. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm super happy that everything materialized and, and worked out. So it was, it was an awesome, it was an awesome watch for sure. All right. What do you say? What's your say, Matt? Um, you know, the, uh, WCW title championship thing, I I care less. I mean, you know, it, it's entertainment. So who the fuck cares? Um, I always thought that was one of the dumbest things that anyone could bitch and complain about because you knew he wasn't going to have that title for more than a handful of days, you know? And that's the one thing. The thing is, why do fans get so pissed? And then you got, you turn around in this documentary where we we first kind of see him at that event uh, where he's doing a signing, and the people, uh, you know, are are basically still blaming this guy for right. ruining everything, which is which is so bizarre, man. Um, and then he goes and. I, I I won't even call it a fucking you know to have backyard wrestling just in a backyard with you know the thing set up and maybe what five people there or whatever it's just fucking ridiculous those people are not trained or, or if they are trained that was not pro wrestling that you saw that was a fucking mugging mm -hmm. you know? and that was ridiculous yeah. Because if you think you're breaking them into the business, fuck off, man. You go to a fucking school that is reputable and you learn your craft. All right. You don't mm -hmm. just go in a fucking ring and take out lightning fucking bulbs and crush them. And I mean, that was fucked up, you know? Yeah. Um, and, then, and then to go as far as to, as to say, um, and he didn't get a payment, you know, so it's like, you know, really giving him the uh, the treatment of, of how these promoters are. And it's like, you know what? That's fucking ridiculous. Yep. That's horrible. That's mm -hmm. that's old mind frame bullshit, mm -hmm. you know, and that's also people who probably have no desire to make it other than in their own mind, you know? Yeah. So that I mean, that was. That let me just, let me ask you guys why back in that time were you so upset because as we saw in the film there were fans and they're and they're still today were upset at the fact that he got the title why was that well, okay if I remember correctly there was a time in, in WWE where I think Vince McMahon was once the WWE champion yep um and I mean, I, I 
I didn't look at it as, oh man, I hate Vince McMahon because he has the championship belt in, in terms of, you know, I hate it. But the storyline, I went along with it. But not, it wasn't a personal thing where it seems like with Arquette, it's more personal that people have it. I'm just kind of curious for you guys during that time when this was happening, why were you so upset that he became the WCW champion? Because he was an outsider to the business entirely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you, have, okay. you have to remember. I, did, I, I didn't have an issue. I, it, obviously, I groaned and was like, what the fuck when Vince went over? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, there was there was some shred of, you know, well, this guy, without this guy, there would be no this. Mm -hmm. um, but with Arquette, he was viewed as an outsider that literally, you know, just got the rub from the you know the highest heights so and, and you, one thing you have to remember too is that the business was taken way more serious back then than today's oh, standards come on whatever <laughs> it's true no it you know? wasn't dude come it on was kayfabe wasn't dead or at least not as dead as it is now when he got the title i think that that i think that plays in perfectly and you simple, make a great point the simple difference is that there was no internet that's it mm. that's it I, I will say that it's interesting you asked that question of why we were so upset first of all i i this is why i thought the documentary was brilliant in the way it was written because what they did is they talked more about the people who dislike it were not so much the fans but indie wrestlers people who are working extra hard. They talked about the generations of wrestlers who, you know, put their body on the line. One guy even said, I missed Christmas a whole bunch of times. So mm -hmm. I think that they tried to paint that in the documentary to show that, look, this is a real business, should be taken care of. Um, we, ordinarily there was a strict rule, which I think Lucky was trying to allude to, was that back then that was kind of a no-no. You know, uh, if you give away the title, you're not really protecting the business. And that was what they talked about in that documentary as well. But for me personally, when I watched it, I didn't like it because up until that point, Arquette had never done any wrestling at all. They didn't showcase him anywhere. They, he was just on actually as an extra person. Said, I would have rather seen Virgil win the damn title than uh, Arquette and have been okay with it. it you know, it, it was just one of those things to where I wasn't as upset as I was with Nikki because I paid for shit and didn't get it. But I would just felt like back in that day, I was just like, wow, man, he, he was on screen. He just wins the title. Is that how it is? I'd, I'd be interested to see if someone took that same approach, but you flipped it this time. You worked your way, you know, up and through the ranks and all that. And he's a big celebrity. And then, you know, he wins a title at a major federation. It'd be interesting to see how that's received. And to Michael's point now, there were, you know, there wasn't the internet. But nowadays, that person would probably get over way more than before because, you know, they could become an internet celebrity. Yeah, but you already had it happen. Yeah. Who was it? I, lucky, who was it? That won the title? Yeah. Who was a celebrity before he joined the Federation? You got me. The Miz. Uh, yeah, and I felt like that I wasn't capitalized. Not, yeah. No, no, you're right, you're right. No, 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 you're right. Yeah. But it wasn't no, capitalized no. because the internet. I mean, the internet was still a little bit fresh because he came from the road rules. And I felt that if the internet was present in the capacity it is today, they really could have captured the shit that they were saying to the Miz. And that's why I have so much respect for him because they were telling him, dude, you're not going to fucking make it. You're not going to make it. And he overcame. He overcame. Yeah, but, the, yeah, but the, no, the point is there is someone who did it. Yeah, no, I, you're, you're absolutely right. No, the Miz totally did it. You know, yeah. I think, I, but I, yeah, I, I didn't, I totally spaced on that. Yeah, the Miz sure did. Because, yeah. because that's how good he is he transitioned himself from being known as a reality star to being a wwe star yeah just as the rock went from being a wrestler to an actor right those are the two i think clearest examples of clear successes 
from going from a wrestler to celebrity and from celebrity to wrestler. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it also just boils down to how much do you want it? I mean, if you want it that bad and you're willing to sacrifice and, and, you know, just take it step by step until you reach your goal, you can do it. And I think this documentary clearly showed um, Arquette's heart, um, not only as a fan, which I think we got a chance to see a glimpse of, unless you really followed Arquette and that was your dude from way back when, how much of a fan he was. I think there's a, there's a, I, I identified a small part with him as I would myself. Like I'm a fan that honestly, I have a discontent with just watching wrestling. Like I would love to take it the next step. It's hard for me to watch and be like, man, I would really like to do it. Not because oh, I can be just like the people on TV. I'd want to start from the very, very bottom and work my way up. You know, I, I could identify with them. And I think there's other people who watch that and maybe feel the same way. He might have do inspired you, some do people. You, do you not think he was trying to, uh, in many ways, trying to prove himself at this age now? And if that's the case, like why, why is that is so important? I mean, he had health issues. Um, clearly, he could have done more damage to himself to do what? To now make fans go, all right, I like David Arquette now. It's the passion. It's, I don't even think it was that. It was redemption. He wanted to right a wrong. Yeah. He uh, wanted to right a wrong. I think to be honest is he wasn't getting work. Well, he did mention yeah. that. He said 10 years is a long time not getting work. I mean, he wasn't getting the, the, you know, the type of work he was getting once. And so what do you do? You do a couple things. You can, you know, do something that in one eyes will make it look like you're reinventing yourself. And then you can make a film about that. And hopefully that draws attention while you're doing it. And then when it comes out. So, you know, this, the project has given them a nice amount of publicity now because that's what your ultimate goal is, right? The goal is not to, you know, be a, a full-time championship wrestler. <laughs> His goal is to make himself known, to make himself liked again, to, you know, correct his image in some eyes, to make people look at him this way or that way, and to sell his product again. Well, you know, I... I I was going to ask a question. Um, did anybody uh, know or, or research or find out with Arquette, is he getting movie roles now? Because I heard, I've been hearing too many rumors from the timeline that coincides with the documentary that Scream, uh, I don't know which one to be, Scream 4, I'm thinking, is is definitely a go once COVID is over. And he's definitely in it. Not coming back as a sideboard, but um, he's definitely he's definitely going to be in it. I wonder, did that, did, did, did this documentary pay dividends toward that? I'm just curious. Uh, I'm just wondering. No, you don't think so? Maybe not. I don't know. No, it didn't mention that at all. Oh, you mean toward how? No, got no. I'm just saying in general. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying in general. That's. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say because that's. It would be different if you got something that was like, you know, a lead role in a Marvel movie. Something. Yeah, or something. <laughs> like that. Hey, Screw's already a, an established franchise in which he has an association with, yeah. and if he's not playing the same character, there's a good chance that he'll actually be playing David Arquette, who played that character in the original movie. You know how, how it works; it's thread through. Mm -hmm. So, you know that they'll figure out a way. Uh, obviously, if he's in, they figured a clever way to get him in. So, do you think this documentary benefits him? moving forward in the future, whether he wants to stay in wrestling, whatever capacity, or- I would tell you this. I believe he's waiting for that call from Tony Khan. That's what I believe. <laughs> oh, you and mean, uh, you mean uh, t-shirt and short wearing Tony out at the table that just yeah. throws money out Catching top? money. Hey. Catching that money. <laughs> we'll, we'll. <laughs> I think we'll, probably we'll. He, would, he would be waiting for that call too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might, All right, might have a better opportunity with that company. I'll be real with you. If you haven't got a chance to uh, view it yet, definitely take a look at it. If you're a wrestling fan, I think you would uh, you will enjoy it. Uh, but you missed one, one huge thing, though. It really sure. quick. The, mm -hmm. the biggest question to me was, um, Simon, were the girls you were with, were, did they fall oh, asleep gosh. while you were watching this? Oh, my gosh. Can we stop with that the narrative? Devil, man. Man. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I actually watched the, uh, uh, you know, the documentary by myself 
uh, full disclosure for anybody watching, do not hang out with high school girls at all. <laughs> not even remotely close. I don't own a Unless compound. You're in high school. No, I don't own a compound with, with <laughs> bu buckets in the background. I don't do any of that type of weird behavior. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, man. oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I'm an Epstein. Okay. Oh, my God, um, stop. <laughs> guys, again, uh, we want to uh, recommend this movie to all of you. You Cannot Kill David Arquette. It's on all the video demands, or, or at least most the most popular ones, Amazon, uh, Apple, Google. Rent it, enjoy it, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure you will. And um, who knows, we may see him pop up somewhere, right? So that is our three count. We thank everyone for hanging out with us in the live video. You can always uh, join when we start the show, and when we see possible, we will uh, read those comments out as well. And with that, that is our three count. Thanks for listening.